So this past several weeks, we're kind of in an emphasis on prayer and seeking God. Uh, just called it 2020 uh, uh, ref reflection and, and clarity and uh, focus. And uh, we've just kind of been in that for the uh, 21 days. I love when churches do this, starting at the beginning of the year, you know, uh, encouraging people to seek God and pray, reestablish a spiritual discipline. So a couple weeks ago, uh, we had an emphasis on prayer. Uh, last week was our emphasis on uh, on scripture reading. So we read through Colossians and Philemon. We read through that together. And this week is a focus on prayer and fasting. I'm going to talk about that a little more in my message, but uh, you should have received like a fasting guide. We put that in your hands uh, today just to kind of give some guidelines, maybe a little more explanation about fasting. So whatever that means to you, and I want to talk to you about it in my message in a minute, but whatever that means to you, however God speaks to you, it's a season of denial, but also for prayer, and it's healthy uh, in the in the walk of the of, of the of the uh, uh, child of God, so just want to uh, mention that to you. I'll talk a little bit in my message about a little bit more detail about that. I've been doing a series for the last three weeks called "Can I Have an Hour to Pray?" I tell the whole story in the first story of of, of that title. But if you've, if you've missed any of that, you can go to our podcast on iTunes. You can go to YouTube. You can go. Uh, to Facebook, our Facebook page, and you can watch and kind of, kind of get, uh, kind of get caught up. So this is the uh, the third week, and in a few moments, I'm going to be uh, reading from Matthew, Psalms 137, Second Chronicles. So I'll be I'll be taking you to those uh, those places as well. Uh, in previous in the in the previous weeks, we've talked about these things: praying, learning to pray God's will over our lives, accepting closed doors. When you pray God's will, accepting the fact that sometimes there might be closed doors. We talked about the prayer blessing, praying God's favor and blessing over your family, over your children. Last week, we talked about the personal prayer time, the prayer group, and the church prayer meeting. We also talked about praying God's word, praying in the name of Jesus, and praying big, bold prayers. We, uh, we talked about that. Uh, last week. So I, I kind of had this passage. It's been a kind of theme. If you're kind of new, Psalms 5, maybe this is your first week. Uh, and it's David's heart for prayer, and it just lays out a little outline. It just says a few things to us. Uh, it says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. So it just tells us in this little passage that regularly David is praying. His time I asked you last week, when's your time to pray? His time was like early in the morning, and he, it was a reverent moment, and he prepared for that. He was giving some thought about his, his prayer time, and then he waited on a response. It, so his prayer life wasn't just something that, you know, that he was, uh, you know, praying to a lifeless God. He was also waiting for a response that the Lord may have for them, so it's a great kind of uh, kind of foundation. So in the in the series, I've kind of been talking for a few minutes just generally about prayer, and then uh, I'll talk specifically about some different types of prayer. You have a prayer card. I give you one of those each week that you can take and and uh, put help to encourage you, remind you, uh, remind you when uh, uh, when uh, when you pray. So let me just take a moment. Let me just talk to you first of all. Just about prayerlessness for a minute, prayerlessness. Now, I don't want this whole series, I don't want you to feel condemned. You know, like if you're not one that regularly prays, I mean, I don't want you to, to feel bad. Sometimes, you know, like after you go to church and it's unintentional, but you can just feel like I'm the worst Christian out there. I'm terrible. I'm just terrible. There's all the Christians over here. Then there's me and Hitler. We're over here. I'm just terrible, and, and I don't want you to feel that way, okay? If, if prayer is not a regular part of your life, I want to inspire you to re on a regular basis to seek the Lord and seek His face. So it's not to throw a stone, but it's maybe to educate and encourage to make prayer, you know, a regular part of your life. Now, I was at a, I I was at a conference very early in my ministry. I was 19 or 20. And I don't remember who it was. I remember the conference. But there were two comments that the guy put on the screen, and I've never forgotten. 
I never forgot them. I've given them to you several times, uh, and I'm going to give them to you again this morning, but they were very impactful to my life. So the first comment uh, was, things happen when you pray that would not ordinarily happen. Do you believe that? We believe that prayer is the catalyst for change. Prayer is the vehicle on how I get to know God better. Prayer is the vehicle for how God changes my heart from the old wretched sinner that I am over the course of my life as I pray. God is transforming me and changing me. And prayer is also how my world is changed as well. I can change my world with God's help through a season of prayer. So things happen when you pray that would not ordinarily happen. And most people agree with that. Then there's the other part of this. Things happen when you don't pray that would not ordinarily happen. Because the enemy is consistently warring against my life. Everything when I pray God's will for, for God to do in my life, the enemy is warring, you know, the warring against that. And it takes prayer, regular times of prayer to make sure that God's will is happening in my life. And let me just say, I think that there are things in our lives sometimes that are there unnecessarily because we've chosen not to pray. All kinds of, you know, uh, you know we, we, we eat the bitter fruit in our lives sometimes because we have not chosen to pray. So things happen when you pray that wouldn't ordinarily happen. Things happen when you don't pray that would not ordinarily happen. So what are some of the causes of of prayerlessness in our lives. So just look at some of these. We're busy. We're busy. Man, wow. I mean, life gets really busy. So sometimes it's not a change of heart or doctrine about prayer. You know, we, you haven't changed your belief in the power of prayer, but just sometimes life gets so hectic and the prayer, the private prayer time just kind of gets pushed out of the way. Or... We get out of the habit. So let's say we're busy. There's something unusual that goes on in our life. And then, man, over a period of time, we just kind of got ourselves out of the habit of regularly coming to pray. It's not a change of heart. But, man, it's just been so long and, you know, getting back in the swing of regular prayer. So just kind of got out of the habit. Or it's a burden. Some we just see it as a, it's a burden. It's just, you know, it's just something that you... You have to do, you know, sometimes we have forgotten the joy that comes from spending time with God. So when we think about prayer, we just see it as a joyless burden in our life. And that can add to prayerlessness. Or, let's just be honest, let's just be honest. The sum is just boring. It's just boring, okay? I mean, you equate, you know, a prayer time with your annual dental exam. I mean, you've got it. You got it on the same level there. You just, oh my goodness, I don't want to, I, I want to, I don't want to do that. And and that may be, you know, part. It's just just boring when I think. Can I just say to you, I don't hear angels sing every time I go to prayer. Can I just say that? Or rarely. Let me let me say that. So some people, it's just it's just boring to them. Wow, I just it's just not anything that's exciting to me. Or or my prayers. They just seem powerless. Like when I pray, you know, I hear all these other prayers. People pray, and it's awesome. And then when I go to pray, it doesn't seem to have kind of the same punch or, or power. So it kind of leads to more prayerlessness if we, if we believe that. So, so if you're prayerless, let me just say something to you. Like I was talking to a guy not long ago, and he... I was just talking to him, you know, about his walk with the Lord, and he said, you know, I really need to, I really need to recommit myself to the Lord, and I opened my mouth to respond to that, and he said, I know, I know, I just need to pray more, and I said, no, no, you don't, you just need to go back and fall in love with Jesus again, okay? I mean, if, if, if that's all it is, if it's a duty and burden sometimes, if it's always boring, then maybe we need to take a step back for a moment and just kind of fall back in love with Jesus because prayer should be something, for the most part, that we 
enjoy doing, that we want to, that we spend time with our Heavenly Father. If all you are seeing prayer as is a Christian duty, then it will have kind of this negative thought in your mind. But when you love Jesus and you, and you, you want to be near Him and you want to grow in your faith, then prayer is not that. Prayer is the opportunity that you get to spend a few moments out of your day with the Lord. So I want to say if prayerlessness And if you're looking, going, yeah, I'm the terrible one. When you give the altar call, I'm coming down first, okay? If that's you, I go, you know what? You know, we need to to take another step back and just just have a moment with the Lord, just a moment of worship, going, hey, Lord, I might have have strayed just a little bit. I may not be where that that I should be with the Lord. And let's deal with it there first from the heart instead of going and pushing you in the prayer closet. And once, I think once that maybe worked out, how you view prayer might might be a little different. So I just, you know, I just just want to I want to mention that to you because when we pray, when we pray, things happen. People can be saved when you pray. How many of you are here as a result of somebody praying you in? Okay, I know I am. I know my mom was praying for this hard headed, loud mouth, you know, rebellious son. And I'm just telling you today, I'm here doing what I'm doing. Because somebody was praying for me. So when you pray, things can happen. People can be saved. People can be healed. Miracles can occur in your life. I mean, there's all kinds of benefits. And and plus, I mean, you get to know God better. And as you're through your prayers, you're changing the world. God is also changing you. God is also changing you. So just wanted to wanted to say that up front. Uh, if you didn't get a prayer guide a few weeks ago, we printed some more, and uh, so just wanted to, you know, that could kind of maybe help you in your in, in your prayer life. So, all right, let me give you let me give you a few types of prayer this morning. So, let's talk about prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Okay, so that would be the temporary absence from food combined with a season of focused prayer. Temporary abstinence from food. Combined with a season of focused prayer. So if there's anything in the Bible that seems old-fashioned and outdated and out of place in our modern culture, I mean, it would be prayer and fasting. Because we live in our culture that we follow every urge, every desire, and every craving. Okay? So if there's anything that people would go, man, that's, that's outdated, it is fasting. Because we are people that move on the urges and desires, and a lot of times it's our puppet as well. I mean, just just for example, if you get off on Monroe and you drive toward downtown, okay? I mean, Cracker Barrel, right off to your right. Best seafood restaurant in Tallahassee, Captain D's is off to your left. (laughs) What? And then on the other side, they just built a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then back on the other side, there is Crystal River. There is Sonny's. There is the melting pot where you have to pay to cook your own food. I've never understood that. (laughs) Then on the other side, there is Bojangles and there is Guthrie's and there is the Grand Chinese Buffet. And to end it all, you end up with Krispy Kreme right there. Now, if you're new to Tallahassee, you may go, hey, was all that restaurant, was that all, you know, on the whole, you know, all the way down to Monroe? No, that's the first hundred yards. <laughs> I mean, we're, we, we are a people, you know, when it comes to denial, we're not, we're not used to that, and especially in this area, but, but they haven't invented anything new to spend time with the Lord besides prayer and fasting. They came to Jesus. He was at a wedding. And they said, Jesus, your disciples are not fasting. And Jesus said, well, the time right is not right now for my disciples to fast. That day is coming. And can I tell you, we are living in that day when his disciples and his followers need to fast. It's part of what we do. So here's what Jesus said. He said, Matthew chapter 6, when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, 
they have received their reward in full. But here's what he says. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. So try to be as discreet as possible. And look what he says when you do this. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There is a blessing, there is a reward that the Lord will give you for seasons of prayer and fasting. So if you look at this passage, it's kind of unusual in the way that it's worded. So it's not a command where Jesus says you have to fast. It's not a request where he says please fast. But it's an assumption because he uses the term when you fast. When you Fast, And we can see people throughout Scripture. We see Moses and David and Elijah and Paul and Esther and Daniel and Anna and even Jesus who a regular part of their life was prayer and fasting. So let's talk about that. Prayer and fasting, let me just give you some things to remember about prayer and fasting. All right, first thing, we don't fast to get God to do something for us, okay? Now you got to be careful on TV because you hear all these miracle fasts and things like that. And I just want you to know, I want you to be very careful and know clearly that, that we cannot manipulate the hand of God the, and the sovereignty of God based on our fasting. We cannot do it, okay? So fasting is not, I do something sacrificially for God over here, and then God is obligated over here to do something for me. Can I just remind you of that? We cannot manipulate the hand and the sovereignty of God for our fasting. So just want to say that sometimes when you see this on TV, sometimes it's kind of, I would use the term quid pro quo, but that's been in the news a lot lately. <laughs> if I do something over here of extreme sacrifice then God, God will do something for me unbelievable. And I'm just telling you, do not tie fasting together. We cannot, we cannot manipulate the hand of God. So I just wanted to say that up front. So the focus of fasting is prayer. It's prayer. It's not just denying ourselves something. So the focus of fasting is the season of prayer. If you're just you know, skipping food and you're not praying, it is a long, hungry day. Let me tell you that. But that's not the focus. It is the combination of fasting and prayer that make it powerful. It is prayer. It is worship. It is intercession. It is scripture reading. It is listening to God through a season of denial that, and, and prayer that is the focus of it, and the fasting adds another element to that that I'll talk about in a moment. Now, there's just, there's just something different about when you go, I'm going to go for a season of prayer and fasting. There's something unusual about that. You know, like, you can be at work, and you can just get busy, okay? You can just get busy, and you miss lunch, and you know you're kind of hungry, you know, but you kind of work through it because you're, you're busy. And, you, and even though you're kind of conscious of it, you don't think about it. Now, when you go, I'm going to fast and pray. And tomorrow I'm starting. The hunger pains are on a whole different level. Let me tell you something. Some of you know what I'm talking about. All right? When you go, Lord, tomorrow is your day. And I'm fasting and praying. And then by 10.30, your co-workers have called the ambulance because you've passed out. Your speech is slurred. they got to put a cookie in your mouth just to save your life. I'm just telling you, when you try to fast, hunger pains are on a completely different level. And you can bank on it. Your restaurant will be going. Your favorite restaurant will be half price. People will bring you food. One guy, he brought me a Big Mac one day. He said, I just was driving by. I just brought you a Big Mac. He set it on my desk. I'm like, really? 
Well, what'd you do? I ate it, you know? <laughs> well, you don't want to be rude because that's against the Bible too. Do not be rude. So I'm just saying to you, there's a whole different, when you set aside some time to pray and fast, <clears throat> it's completely different in how it works out in your life. The, the enemy came to Jesus when he was most hungry. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every a word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he's just, in that comment, he's just reminding us that there are more important things in this world, our connection with God, our relationship with God, our ability to hear God, to be like Christ. There are, more, there are things that are more important in our life than just, simply, than just simply food. It reminds us our appetites and urges do not control us. Fasting reminds us that our appetites and urges do not control us because normally our cravings, urges, and desires run our life, and we are its puppets. Whenever our crazy cravings, urges, and desires say to do something, we, we act, act that out, and we respond to that. But fasting positions our hearts and our minds, and it reinforces in our life that we are not subject to our urges and and desires, but we are subject to the Holy Spirit. It's called self-control. Look at Galatians Galatians chapter 5. Fasting is not just about the denial of food, but it's about the strengthening of the willpower. It's about uh, the the reemergence of self-control. Fasting reminds my inner man and my flesh that God is in control and that I'm not, I am not its puppet. And when I can do something like that, then it helps me on things like resisting temptation because I've strengthened that part of my life. I've said to my body, you don't own me. You're not in control of me. I've proven that. I've proven that through fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer brings God into a clear spiritual focus. It creates focus for us. It creates more moments and opportunities for us to seek God. So when you fast, when you would normally be eating, you should find a time to pray. I know that's a little difficult sometimes when you're at work. You know, maybe you can modify that a little bit and pray more later. But the the denial part of that is supposed to be less distractions and more focus in my life. So if some of you said, I'm giving up social media, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But the time that you would have normally spent on that needs to be needs to be in a time of prayer. And let me just tell you, some of your social media, you're going to have a lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time. So... It, it, it creates focus. It lessens the distractions of my life. It gives me more time. It's supposed to free up some time temporarily so that I can spend time with the Lord. And I just want to say, too, you may find that once those distractions are clear and there's some more clarity in your mind and there's not as much running around as your head, you might be, you might be surprised that a word may come forth out of your heart. God may speak something to you. So that's why fasting pulling back on distractions and saying no and so that we can hear God's voice. That's why fasting is, is important. The last thing about prayer and fasting, some spiritual battles are only one. They came to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, here's some spiritual conflict and he, <laughs> that we're having. And Jesus said, that spiritual conflict only comes with prayer and fasting. Okay? That we're combining fasting and prayer. So I want to say to you that there are times and seasons where the spiritual you know, warfare is intense and we may need to go into a time of fasting, uh, of fasting and prayer for intense spiritual conflict, okay? So just wanted to say that. So I just want to encourage you, pray about it. What do you feel like God would have you to do? How do you feel this week? What is something that you can give up to replace with prayer in God's word, it's about focus, it's about clarity, it's about hearing from the Lord. But ultimately, fasting is about getting to know Jesus better, okay? Because let me just tell you, if I know Jesus better than whatever's going on in my life, I'm going to be okay, okay? 
So that's, the, the, that's what fasting does. So we gave you a little fasting guide, kind of give you some guidelines. You should have that in your hand. If I can answer any questions about that, I'll be glad to do it. All right, so let's look at this, the next part of prayer, all right? Wrestling, waiting, and praying through. Wrestling, waiting, and praying through. So last week, <clears throat> at the end of the service, we talked about praying big, bold prayers. Big, bold prayers. We're, we're not going to let our eyes or, you know, our past experiences keep us from believing God for, you know, for big things. But what happens, you know, we even, I used to use the, the, pa- the, the passage, say unto this mountain, be thou removed and to cast into the sea. Well, I have a question. What if your mountain does not move? What if you speak to that mountain and it does not move? Can I just Reminds you that this morning, this morning, that there are sometimes very complicated issues. There's spiritual warfare that that arises, and it takes more than a five-minute prayer to kind of resolve this thing. So, what if you say to your mountain, and you speak to your mountain to move, and it's still there? It's still there. We can see an answer to this in the life of Hannah. In, in Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, you know the, the story, she could not have a child. She could not have a child. And in, in verse 7, it says this went on for years. She is broken. She cannot, she cannot have a child. Verse 10, it says in her deep anguish, she prayed to the Lord. This wasn't a five-minute kind of pop in, pop out. This was combined with some brokenness and some intensity that she sought the Lord. Can I remind you this morning that regardless of what you see, you keep praying and believing. Regardless of what you see, you keep praying and believing. If you speak to that mountain and it's still there, in the morning, then you keep speaking and you keep believing. And she did that. And you know the whole, you know, the, the whole story, uh, for verse 12. It says, she kept on praying to the Lord. Over the course of the years, she wants to have a child, she can't. So over the course of several years, listen, she didn't give up. She didn't throw in the towel. She didn't get discouraged. And even when she prayed, there was a time that she prayed in the temple and she was praying so hard, man, that the priest thought she was drunk. That's what the scripture says. Just the intensity. She was not conscious of other people around. She just kept praying. So I want to say to you, we know know the story eventually, she became pregnant. So I just want to remind you about wrestling and waiting and praying through Regardless of what you see, keep praying and believing. Jesus even gave us this encouragement, Luke chapter 18. This is what Jesus said. He was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. He's showing them a parable that at all times they should pray and not lose heart. And you remember the parable. It's the widow woman that keeps coming back to the judge and says, hey, I need some protection from my enemy. And the judge is irritated, so he just doesn't respond. And she comes back and she said, hey, I need protection from my enemy. He doesn't respond. She comes back again. Hey, I need protection from my enemy. And the parable is finally the judge says, hey, you know what? And he uses the term, because you are bothering me, I'm going to grant this prayer. So I'm just saying to you, sometimes we speak to a mountain and we move on and don't even think about it when we've got to regularly speak to that mountain every morning. Jesus said that at all times people ought to pray and not lose heart. So we wrestle, we wait And we pray through. Look at Jacob. It said he was 
he was worried about Esau coming. And it said he wrestled with the Lord all night. He wrestled with the Lord. I mean, he's, he, he's not, he doesn't have his 10-minute, you know, got his timer. And then the timer goes off and he, he goes back to the TV. No, he was, this was something that was burdensome to him all night. Because sometimes prayer is not just kneeling down for a few moments. Sometimes it's intense. Sometimes there are tears that flow. Sometimes your heart is broken and, you, and, and you're doing like Jacob. Jacob is going, Lord, I'm not, I'm not leaving, Lord, until I have an answer. I want to say to you in this culture, in this society today that there are times in our life that it takes more than the 10-minute devotional time. Sometimes we are wrestling with God. We are crying. We are praying over a long period of time. But we are not being discouraged at all. We are praying through. See, that's an old term. Some of you don't even know what that means. Praying through. Praying through. Some of you know what it means. It tells me how old you are, okay? It just means when I'm praying over something, I'm not giving up until I feel a release in my heart for the Lord. I'm going to keep praying over that thing every day. I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm not going to just let my eyes determine my prayer intensity. I'm going to keep praying and praying and praying until I see what I'm praying about come about before my eyes or I feel a release in my heart that God is in control of this thing. It's praying through, praying through. And I want to, I want to say this too, just at the end. Now listen to me. We also may need to realize that God's plan in certain areas may be different from mine as well. Okay? Now that is not a statement of defeat. We pray and we pray and we pray. And then there are times that the Lord may answer that differently than we want, but He's answered the prayer. So I'm just saying we never know God's sovereign hand in our life. But it's not my responsibility to figure out God's sovereign hand it is my responsibility to pray and seek the face of God. So let me just say, like, so if one day I'm sick, I don't need you going, well, it might be not God's sovereign plan. No. I need you praying. I need you seeking. I need you believing. We don't, we don't stop. We don't give up. We leave, we leave acts of God's sovereignty to God. But until then, we pray and we seek God's face. So I want to encourage you this morning. If you've spoken to your mountain and it has not moved, that does not mean that it will not move in the future. You keep praying. You keep decreeing. You keep calling it out in faith with great boldness and faith. You keep praying and speaking to that mountain. You may be surprised one day. Poor Hannah, all, all broken, torn up. Years and years and years. One, way she, one day she gets up, got a little flutter in her stomach. She vomits and praise God, she got morning sickness. You never know. Never know. Last thing, last thing this morning. Prayer and worship. I'm going to talk to you about prayer and worship. <clears throat> so like in most prayer settings, uh, worship and praise come first. In most prayer settings, that kind of just kind of the way it, it goes. Worship and prayer, you see it in church or praise, and it, it, it kind of sets the table, you know, for sets the stage for petitions, intercessions, thanksgiving, just worship, just kind of, you know, it kind of precedes that, you know, like maybe like the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, and then it starts going down the list of praying things. So worship and praise in the context of prayer and your personal prayer are, you know, they're, they're really important. Now, now, just to draw distinction, thanksgiving is an expression of gratitude for what God has done. Thanksgiving is an expression of gratitude for what God has done. He saved us. He's delivered us. So we're thankful for that. But worship and praise is a little bit different because we are expressing and acknowledging God for who he is. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit different 
distinction there, but I want to draw your attention to worship and praise in the context of, of, our, of our prayer time. So worship and praise is acknowledging God for, you know, for who He is. So when we praise God, we praise Him that for His unchanging nature. We praise Him that He is all-powerful. We praise Him that He is our ruler and our creator. We praise Him because He is faithful. We praise Him because He is good. We praise Him because He is kind. We praise Him because He is loving. We praise Him because He is merciful. We praise we praise Him because He's our protector and He's our sustainer. We praise Him because He is our Savior. We praise Him for the cross of Jesus. We praise Him for the blood of Jesus. We praise Him for the life transformation that has come our way. We praise Him that now He sits exalted at the right hand of God. That's how we praise Him. Can we do that this morning? Let's praise Him. Man, I mean, when you just start thinking about the goodness of God, wow. So it's not thanksgiving, it's, it's praise. So years ago, I took my kids to the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, so we get on the train at Williams, Arizona, take the train over there. It's a nice little experience. We get off the, you know, we get off the train, walk through the gift shop, of course. Got it. Got I walk through the gift shop. And then when you go through the gift shop, you, you step out really on, the, on the, the brink of the Grand Canyon. And I, I didn't know how to respond, react. I'd never been there, but I kind of stood on the, on the corner of that, and I just kept going, wow. There was just times of silence. I was just speechless at the, how big it was, the depth, you know, like you see pictures, but man, really, it doesn't really, you know, define the colors and the depth, and I just kept going, wow, that's unbelievable. I would go, I am speechless, which is a dumb sentence because I'm saying I'm speechless, so, but I'm just, I'm just, I, I could not really put into words my feeling from standing there and witnessing that for the very first time. And can I say to you this morning, sometimes we've lost the wow of worship. Sometimes we've been around His majesty and we've been around His glory and we've seen it and been there so many times that there is no wow in our worship anymore. There is not anything that inspires us, you know, just kind of coming out of our heart to praise and magnify God. Go back to your, your first time of worship right after you're saved. You didn't need a song. You didn't need somebody else's song. It's just coming out of your heart. It's just flowing. It's just flowing just flowing kind of kind of out of your heart. And, man, you can't help it. You can't help it. Man, there will be times that there's a song of the Lord, a worship experience that kind of happens in your life. And you get this song, and, man, it just starts to control your whole life. You can't help it. Everybody you work with is all down and discouraged. But you know what? The wow of worship is sitting in your heart, in your life. And man, you even get ready and you go to church on Sunday morning. And man, you've got the song of the Lord that's in your heart, in your life. You look around. Nobody else is moving. Nobody else is singing. They're just standing there. But you know what? You don't care because you've got the wow of worship. You are reminded of God's goodness and God's faithfulness and His kindness and His loving kindness. And there's just something 
that moves you. There's just something in a way that you cannot, you cannot contain yourself anymore because you've been reminded of the goodness of God and the glory of God. Would you give him praise this morning? Everybody else can stand around and look bad, but I got the wild worship this morning. I got a song of the Lord. I'm going to move. You know, but then, then, then things happen in your life. You get a pink slip. You get a doctor's, you know, response or notification that you didn't want something. You got family relationships that are you know, veering off course. Something happens to that song. You know, like the Israel, Israelites, man, they were people of worship. They used to work out in the field and they would sing their songs to the Lord. And then one day the Babylonians come in and they take them all in captivity. They take them all in captivity. And man, that song that used to come was gone. Psalms 137 is reflective of this. It says, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept and we remembered Zion. And there on the poplars we hung our harps. Their song was gone. They couldn't because they were in a foreign land. And that passage says, the, the, the tormentors used to say, hey, sing the songs of Zion. And they said, we can't sing anymore because we're in a foreign land. So they had taken those harps that were representative of their praise and they just hung them on the trees. You ever gone through a time that you lost your song? Your song of worship, the wow, the wow of worship is gone. We've walked through a season of discouragement and defeat and the song of the Lord that used to come out of our heart is not, is not there anymore. Second Chronicles Chapter 20 says they came to Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, and said there's an army coming that you cannot defeat. It's so big, it's so large, it will mean certain defeat. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved, look what he did, to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. He called people together to pray, and then he called them to fast And pray as well. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. And then a word from God emerged out of that season of fasting and prayer. This is what he said to Jehoshaphat, the prophet. He said, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or be discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours but God's. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance that God will give you. Jerusalem, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. He got that word out of season of prayer and fasting. Do I need to preach that, or can you put that together on your own? All right, I'm going to leave that with you. So he does something unusual. He's got this word. Great worship team, you guys can come. He does something unusual here. Second Chronicles in 2021, 20, look at this. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him For the splendor of his holiness. And they went out at the head of the army. So you got your front line troops. You got your marines. Your SEAL team six. You got your best folks up front. But he said I'm going to do a little something different this morning. I'm going to take the worship team and put them out front. And here is what They are supposed to sing. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. 
Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. What poor military advice that would be. Can you imagine George Patton on the brink of the Battle of the Bulge going, Hey, would you take the army band and put them up front? Jehoshaphat says, No, put the worship team out front. Now I'm sure the worship team probably didn't agree with that. Sometimes battles that we fight are not battles of flesh and blood. Sometimes battles that we fight are not battles of flesh and blood. Because this was not a season, listen to me, this was not a season of of rebuking. This was not a season of interceding. This was a season of worship on the brink of, of the greatest battle that they had ever had. Isaiah reminds this, uh, reminds us of this when he says, put on a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Worship God. Worship God. Magnify God. Praise God. But yes, don't we need to be praying? Don't we need to be interceding? There is a time for that. But there is also a time that you stand back and go, this is much larger than I could ever handle. The only thing I know to do is praise and magnify God. So I want to remind you this morning in your time of prayer that your greatest weapon is worship. My weapon is my worship. And I'm going to praise and magnify God. When you don't have it in your heart to pray another prayer, when there are no more tears that can flow out of your eyes, when you don't have the strength to let it come off your lips one more time, then you just back up. You just lift your hands and you just begin to magnify God. You just praise Him and say, Lord, I thank You for Your unchanging nature. I thank You, Lord, that You are all powerful. Lord, I thank You that You are the ruler and the creator of all. Lord, I thank You that You are faithful. I thank You that You are good. I thank You that You are kind. I thank You that You are loving. I thank You that You are merciful. I thank You that you are my protector. I thank you that you are my savior. I thank you for the cross of Jesus. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for a changed life that you've given me. And I thank you this morning that you are exalted and on the right hand of God. And I have nothing within my hand to bring to you this morning, but I've only got the worship that's coming off my lips today. Let's praise him this morning. Praise him this morning. He looked out and said, is that singers? <laughs> really? Really? Do I see the band leading the way? Well, this is going to be an easy one. But the Bible says, as they begin to magnify and they begin to praise God, God's presence, God's spirit came down. And God gave a military victory that day in the physical that only came through a season of praise in the time of prayer. I want to remind you when you pray. I want to remind you when you pray. I know sometimes we're busy and we go straight to petition. We go straight to intercession. But I'm telling you, you're missing something if you don't start with worship and praise. You're just, you're just missing something if you don't put on your favorite worship song for a moment and begin to magnify God and begin to praise God because my greatest weapon is my worship. 
Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor at Generations Church. Thank you for watching our service. If you're a guest, please fill out the contact information at gctlh.org forward slash connect. Please know it's our desire to provide ministry to every age, starting at GC Kids Junior, our nursery program, all the way through our senior adults that we call teenagers. We also have many ways that you can be involved at Generations Church, one of which is our small groups that we call connect groups, or you can find your place of ministry in one of our serve teams. Please know that we appreciate you watching, and we hope to see you in one of our services very soon. If you have any questions about our church or want to respond in any way to the service, please feel free to message us at info at gctlh.org. God bless you, and thank you for watching.